Welcome. Thank you for attending this session on fully autonomous storage and memory hierarchies. I am Irfan Ahmed, the CEO and founder of Magnition IO. Magnition IO is a company focused on providing technology and algorithms for the future of storage and memory hierarchies, in particular for fully automated and fully autonomous storage systems. Prior to this, I was a founder of Cloud Physics, recently acquired by Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and I used to work at VMware uh, in the operating system kernels and then the storage DRS, storage IO control teams. Those teams uh, I was a tech lead for, and uh, we brought to market lights out data center management uh, products, including DRS, uh, distributed power management, and storage resource management products. I have uh, 40 plus patents and more than 10 peer reviewed papers to my name, uh, including three best paper awards. And originally I'm a Mathy and still a Mathy at uh, heart and a CS Geek. So the key question to start with is, does the storage industry and the memory industry, do we need fully autonomous systems? What's been happening obviously in the last few years is difference and divergence in available technology that uses artificial intelligence, machine learning, and wide scale data analysis to automate tasks for consumers. And today we have uh, autopilot systems and self driving and fully autonomous systems that are being prototyped and uh, actually being tested on California roads. Uh, and this is the state of the art when it comes to autonomous systems in cars, for example. However, for enterprise storage customers and data center operators, the seen is a little bit more dire, and we're quite far from being able to build uh, fully autonomous data center systems. And there's lots of reasons for that, and we'll discuss some of them today. In some ways, the problem, uh, the challenging machine learning problems associated with fully autonomous data center infrastructure are actually somewhat different and somewhat unique, uh, and in some cases, a little bit more challenging than what is what are found in other domains. So uh, we aim, uh, hopefully, together as an industry, to deliver fully autonomous systems so that uh, we can uh, change how our, the operators and the customers uh, of these products maintain these systems. So it is fairly well known that storage is a very straightful, stateful resource uh, and the combination of very dynamic workloads and uh, the stateful nature of the resource fundamentally, which is uh, storage and memories and caches, um, which uh, don't easily lend themselves to rapid changes in resource policies because data movement is involved, warm-up times are involved, et cetera. That the combination of the complexity of the resource, as well as the highly dynamic nature of workloads, uh, has made automation actually quite a difficult task. And this is not for the lack of trying. Researchers in, this, in these areas have been trying for several decades now to automate storage resource management with you know, sort of, I, I would say, limited results. Uh, however, that is starting to change. And this is in contrast, of course, to the other highly dynamic domain that we know is starting to achieve full autonomy, which is self-driving cars. And even though both sides have had that dream, both of these industries have had that dream for probably a very similar length of time, uh, but the problems in uh, and the sensors available and the modeling tools available in automation or automotive industry has been actually a little bit further ahead of the data center industry. So on the right hand side, you'll see some visualizations for LIDAR um, and combinations of LIDAR and camera based object detection while vehicles are in motion in multiple directions, as well as static obstacles, uh, being able to map them, uh, including hints from GPS on uh, drivable roads and, and locations and distances and so on. On the left, we see uh, quite dynamic behavior from storage workloads and storage systems. You see some visualizations for uh, access patterns for disk workloads uh, taken from real production uh, customers in, in the background on the left. Uh, and over uh, large uh, chunks of time, including uh, the leftmost visualization over several days and even a week, uh, you see these heat maps of varying levels of activity, uh, varying levels of reuse distances, varying levels of um, access patterns uh, that are quite dynamic. Uh, now when we visualize them in the just the right way and we apply just the right level of tools we can actually derive some uh, patterns and we can become more predictive and that's where the most recent research in this field has been taking us so if we look here at the um, the plot that is constantly moving that that's another specific example we'll talk a little bit more about in a few minutes and this one is looking at the 
uh, the highest, most expensive tiers in a storage system, which are the tier zero caches. And this particular case, this is a customer workload that exhibits uh, quite a dramatic shift in the working set of the workload over a very short period of time that would require for the purposes of achieving SLOs uh, quite a dynamic algorithm. And today those algorithms are not possible because we have not been building autonomous systems that really do self use self-awareness and real-time modeling uh, and adaptive mitigations to address these challenges. And the only tools available today to deal with these types of bursts and uh, you know in, in the equivalent of this in uh, self-driving cars would be pedestrians crossing the road or a, a certain highway undergoing construction and now the system has to figure out uh, some evasion or unexpected traffic and so on. Uh, and so whereas in those domains, um, those models are starting to get mature, but uh, we are just now in the world of storage and uh, memory and resource management trying to achieve those uh, goals. And so this visualization, again, from a real customer workload environment, gives us the ability to just visually get a sense for how over the course of um, just minutes, that uh, this workload can have such a dramatic shift in its uh, working set uh, and the cost associated with operating that working set out of a uh, tier zero memory. So with this background, uh, let's jump in and talk about the current state of the art, which is manual storage and memory, manual memory management. Well, that's starting to become infeasible and we've hinted at this already. So on the one hand, applications, uh, workloads, uh, and uh, their data requirements is starting to change very frequently. It is not uncommon for an application to undergo actual code changes um, hourly, uh, especially in microservices oriented applications where applications spread out over a large network. Now, similarly, it is not uncommon to see uh, application, actual customer driven and user driven workload activity, which results in of course, certain storage access patterns change by the minute. Uh, and that frequency and that intensity uh, variance is actually starting to increase a lot and volatility is going up. Uh, on the other hand, uh, thankfully, we have more hardware variety more than ever to be able to handle uh, these uh, variations. Unfortunately, along with those additional layers and tiers of storage and memory, uh, storage class memories and just memory, uh, along with those additional layers and tiers comes naturally complexity. So that hardware complexity is actually making it uh, harder and harder. And, and I think at this point in time, basically infeasible to successfully manually manage storage and uh, memory allocations. And so the result of that is that uh, we are increasingly being vulnerable to technical challenges and underlying technical problems, including things like thrashing and interference, uh, unpredictable availability, and so on, that ultimately from a business point of view lead to the only things we can do, which is over-provisioning. Uh, and obviously there's a huge lack of control over those resources uh, because of these emerging trends in ap application workloads, as well as in hardware. So this overall leads to a much higher risk all across the board. Uh, and the only way out, we believe, is for fundamentally changing our industry to start to build and bring to market and uh, work together to, uh, to make this standards around fully autonomous storage and fully autonomous memory hierarchies. So that's really what I'm trying to establish in the first part of this uh, conference talk is to establish the need and then think a little, let's think together a little bit on how we can go forward. So autonomous systems uh, pretty commonly have a certain loop, right? Now, and this idea of the OODA loop and there's other types of loops like this we could imagine. Uh, this particular one goes back to uh, John Boyd, a famous uh, fighter uh, test pilot. Uh, the idea is you enter a loop of, of observations, orientation, decision, and action. So here called the OODA loop. So a lot of autonomous systems uh, run one or often many more than one OODA loops. So observation comes from instrumentation and being able to record that instrumentation makes sense of it. Orientation has to do with being able to model the bits and bytes of data that are coming from the sensors and um, put them in context and, uh, and, and adjust models about how the world's behaving and how various systems are behaving under various types of stress and loads. And then to convert that into some decision that uh, indicates uh, an expectation of a, uh, the ability to adjust the course of events in the future. And that decision has to take many things into account, including cost benefit analysis, right? The accuracy of the models and the stability periods of what the uh, models indicate. And finally, an action, the actuation capability to actually be able to change the system and uh, uh, affect what uh, will then be uh, handled in the future. So this is fairly fundamental to autonomous systems. Now, 
in the world of storage, we can learn from other domains once again and understand and try to build a taxonomy a little bit of the models and the types of systems and uh, characteristics that have to be learned in an autonomous storage and an autonomous memory hierarchy infrastructure. So I categorize these into kind of two very high level, 10,000 foot level uh, domains. So first is a certain class of models that have to do with self-awareness and another class which has to do with environmental awareness. So if we just think about cars for a second, self-driving cars, self-awareness is about, you know, how does this car accelerate? And uh, that's not just static. It could actually be something that's a little bit dynamic as the car gets older or as the car uh, undergoes different stresses and different conditions. That acceleration may not actually be a static notion. It actually be a, would likely be a model. Uh, and the self-awareness self of the self-driving autonomous system has to take that and really think about it as a model, right? Uh, similar to braking, what is the braking capability of this vehicle right now under the conditions that it's confronting, as well as what are the standard expectations around braking? Uh, steering, what is the steering capabilities? How much do you steer to achieve what angle and what speed and so on? The multidimensional model here. Roll, what is the maximum amount of steering taking various factors into account that can be accomplished before the car will uh, go out of control in terms of a roll? Uh, so steering has other types of auto-control conditions that have to be modeled. Wear and tear, weight distribution, uh, battery discharge as a model uh, which is dependent upon uh, independent variables like temperature and load and so on. So this is self-awareness. Now, similarly, environmental awareness, of course, GPS, maps, on a, the ability to detect and, and understand static obstacles versus dynamic op op obstacles, the ability to reason through what the capabilities are from a physics perspective of the objects that are both dynamic and uh, static uh, in the environment. Uh, what is the terrain like? What are the distances and relative object velocities? And how does that relate to those capabilities of the objects that have been detected uh, and tracking those over time and adjusting and updating models? Uh, similarly, road conditions, weather, uh, being able to identify law enforcement, versus uh, other entities uh, that are found in the environment. Now, applying that to sort of that motivation and that uh, understanding into the world of autonomous data infrastructure systems, right? We can also do a self-awareness versus environmental awareness categorization. So for example, in self-awareness, we have to be able to understand the tiers of memories and disks and flash that are existing in the system as the hardware of the system, right? Think of this as like the brakes and the acceleration capabilities, right? So here we have caches that provide the tremendous acceleration. Uh, we have memories. We have different types of memories that, are, that have different capabilities around read-write asymmetries, uh, statefulness, and so on, persistence, et cetera. Data paths, right? What are the data paths in the system? That, that govern latency as well as that uh, may have or may not have redundancies? What are the length throughputs that are available? And what are the limitations around that? And what are the um, uh, what, what happens when those get pushed beyond a certain border? What is the uh, throughput loss in those situations and so on? Uh, then we come to the media itself, data movement costs, performance capabilities of the different media. What happens if there is a degraded scenario? What is performance going to look like in that scenario? What is the rebuild time going to look like in that scenario? Right? So all of these things have to do with self-awareness that has to do with the behavior of the devices that uh, we can reason about and model and create standard models around. Then, of course, we have environmental awareness. So in the case of storage uh, and memories, workloads are extremely dynamic, right? They, they, they change by the microseconds in, in the cases of memory and nanoseconds uh, oftentimes. And so these are exceedingly dynamic systems and much more dynamic per unit of time than, for example, a uh, self-driving vehicle. And to be able to then do QS constraints and dealing with uh, congestion, other factors that may be at play on the links here uh, is actually quite challenging. So we have to be able to build awareness of that, right? So dynamic costs is a very interesting thing in the context of cloud storage and uh, cloud caches and cloud memories, because now we have the opportunity to actually dynamically and elastically manage the resources that we are utilizing. But that means we have to understand the uh, IS cost. Of course, there's failures, there's imminence of failures, probability distributions of failures, wear and tear scenarios for external resources that we're using, power constraints because of power budgets that may or dynamically be present, temperature, and, and so on. So this allows us to now start to build a bit of a vocabulary around what are the underlying models that we need to create and how real-time those need to be and how they need to self-adapt and become self-aware so that we can end up at the end of the day with uh, storage and memory systems that are fully autonomous. Now, of course, we can also map what are fairly well-known autonomous uh, system levels in other domains into what could happen uh, in the world of storage. So here is my own taxonomy around this. Um, I believe that if we map directly that uh, we get uh, very interesting levels and I think we should really standardize around this and, and uh, work together to define these as clearly as possible so that we can have a a common vocabulary, common taxonomy around this. So this is what I posit, but I think uh, we should centerize on, around this. So at the level one, we have something very similar to what we have today. We have some very advanced storage systems today that where the admin does control the device ultimately. 
the storage admin or the cloud admin, but the device itself is providing a lot of alerts and hints and, and recommendations and so on. Now we have some fewer systems in the market that would be partial automation. These include the ability to have automated automated failure repair, backup, replication that is completely automated, right? Uh, recovery mechanisms whereby the system can not just be sending alerts and, and detect conditions, but also be able to take evasive maneuvers and do its self-repair, self-recovery. So we have plenty of systems in the market that, that are doing this today. Now, as we go up the levels, we get to the conditional automation level. This is where in the world of self-driving cars, that the car starts to manage, to manage many of these safety critical driving functions. But the expectation is that the driver must be ready to take control and we're sitting right behind the wheel um, of the steering wheel and be able to take over. Now, in this case, my mapping to the world of infrastructure is that the devices are managing many of the cost and performance trade-offs and their uh, availability trade-offs. But of course, you still have an alerting system and still have the user interface and the controls to be able to take over and, and handle the types of functions that are not really uh, fully automated. Now, when you get to level four, I think we get to the exciting stuff. So here, the device is gar can guarantee quality service constraints at the lowest cost. For example, it can guarantee the, uh, of course, at, at you know certain SLOs that availability and durability will be achieved up to certain levels of, say, for example, nines, that the device becomes self-aware and can self-troubleshoot you know, the vast, vast majority of, of issues that could arrive. Certainly all safety critical and performance critical issues, now the device is able to self-troubleshoot. And here, you know, because we haven't achieved 100% in terms of self-awareness and self-troubleshooting and self-correction, self-repair, the admin still has the steering wheel. Uh, we, he or she should not have to use it very often, but it is there and available, and the admin has the option to control to, to make sure that the most safety critical functions can be overridden. Level five is when we take that away. So in the case of cars, we take away the steering wheel. There is no driving equipment. The vehicle is completely driverless. In the case of systems, data center infrastructure, in particular storage, my view is perhaps this is where we truly achieve the nirvana of a lights out, hands off, data center. Uh, and, and for storage, that is a very difficult task, right? So there is no control UI. I mean, we would love to at some point in time get to there, right? Where all that the operator is specifying is high level policy controls. And, you know, the device orders its own spare parts at some point in time. And all the admin really has to do until the robotics take over is to just install those spares as and when an imminent uh, condition is noticed. Every single other thing now really just becomes an internal question for the device, which is completely self aware and completely uh, able to perform self troubleshooting and self repair. And all you do is you, pro you provide your high level quality service controls. So this is I think where we are now finally able to journey because we have so we have amassed over the last couple of years enough of the building blocks of models and capabilities that will allow us to build fully autonomous level five systems for storage and memory hierarchies over the course of the next few years. And that's an area that I'm very particularly excited about. I've spent the last four years building technology components to be able to solve those problems. And I'm very happy to work with the broader storage community to bring those ideas to full fruition and practical deployments. And that's the sort of stuff that in the lab today is exceedingly promising. So here, I thought we would zoom out a little bit and start to talk about at the high level before diving into the details of the various components that uh, would make up a fully autonomous storage system. Maybe we could start with what is the high level architecture of a fully autonomous storage or memory hierarchy? So here, you know, we have the OODA loop back, which is going to be fundamental to any uh, autonomous systems. On the left-hand side, we have our applications and microservices that could be legacy applications or modern container-based Kubernetes orchestrated types of applications. And they're running against a storage system, could be a cloud storage system, a database, uh, could be a dedupe engine, could be cache or computer engine, or, or usually more often than not, a combination of those that have been put together in an enterprise grade product. So first thing is from left to right, we have instrumentation. And so that instrumentation crosses over between observe and orient. So with that instrumentation, we're able to take operating system level, device level, uh, event level, RPC level, message level information. In the case of you know, low level storage, think of it as IO access patterns. That we're able to instrument them in a very lightweight sort of way. Obviously, we cannot model every single IO request, but the most recent research in this area has enabled us to have very low sampling ratios, or down to 0.1% sampling ratios. As long as those samples are very carefully selected, we can still end up with 99% accurate models and be able to do that in real time because of our sampling rates being quite manageable. So we first think about instrumentation so that we can complete the observe step and be able to then repeatedly with extremely low cost, maintain the ongoing observation. So when we talk about orientation, this is always going to be about modeling. So how do we fit those specific measured vectors of performance and availability um, and uh, translate them into the models we have already learned and furthermore, update those models from with the new knowledge and information that is arriving uh, and so that we can continue to learn and reinforce our models and improve them. And so now now, with this orientation around the models of how the system behaves or is expected to behave and the learning that's associated with it, now we enter the really the predict phase, right? And this is what's going to lead us to the ability to decide. So when we get to the predict phase, right, we are now looking 
we were using our models and our instrumentation, instrumented observations that we have been seeing in real time about how the system is behaving with the workloads that it's dealing with and translate those into a series of what ifs from which we decide what decision to make to improve the situation or to correct an imbalance or to bring the system back into QoS compliance that has drifted away from it based on our recent observations. So in this step, of obviously, we have very sophisticated algorithms that we need to implement, including cost-benefit analysis and, and stability analysis, system stability analysis, to be able to ensure that the system remains stable and we're able to um, keep this uh, all of the QoS constraints. So with the predictions and the observations in hand, using our models, we're able to make decisions. 